Can you just introduce yourselves like uh, quickly and uh, where where you met and how you uh, your connection to Spiral Tribe briefly Brief, because it's a long it's a long story. I it's know. a long story. I know, I know, but just briefly so that people know who you are. Do you want to go first? Uh, no. <laughs> question. Um, well, Debbie and I first met uh, probably in 1990, I imagine, um, back in London, uh, around the Kilburn um, High Road, High Street, High Road. Mm -hmm. um, I think <coughs> Debbie was having um, a small party, it's where I really got to know her, in her tiny little flat, which is basically just a, a few streets away from where me and my brother uh, were. I'd recently moved down from Manchester um, and yeah it was quite kind of a chaotic party as I remember because it was very small uh, there was a small garden there was a big fire in the back in the back garden um, and yeah we were up all night I do remember some um, red dragons going around um, I remember Tim who makes the um, noise control audio. I remember him launching a wardrobe off the top of the roof um, that narrowly missed me in the garden for some more firewood. But it was a good party. And then I remember walking across London after that party and finding that um, a lot of it had been destroyed, especially around Trafalgar Square, was actually still um, smoking debris uh, from the poll tax riot. So it was that night for me when I really kind of uh, got to know Debbie and her crew. Though we had kind of met a few times, hadn't we? Mm, at Rose Farm. Um, at Rose Farm mm. and then um, at the dance party, mm. um, which was a nice little rave thing. But that's where we really got to know each other. And uh, very quickly, within a few weeks, I think, we were squatting a big schoolhouse around the corner from there. So this, this all happened in the same locale. Um, and that had a large basement, a big gymnasium, uh, large classrooms and of course one thing led to another what do you do when you find yourself squatting that beautiful kind of space you organize a party and that's where we really sort of um, chimed wasn't it um, with you coming around because you were a builder at the time a plasterer that's right you? Yes. you had your big bag of tools yes. your overalls <clears throat> and mucking in and helping with the painting and the decorating and you know just generally sort of um, making the thing happen mm. Uh, which was just a hope, uh, you know, a kind of future hope that we could actually get something going on. But of course, making the space um, that, that, that things can happen in was a very important part of that, you know, making the basement even darker than it was, you know, putting the decorations up. And as that happened and the weeks unfolded, so more and more people got involved and we, we actually built a little community uh, around, that's the schoolhouse, around the schoolhouse. And then after that, you came up with this mad idea of organising a party in Amsterdam. And um, me and someone said, yeah, we'll come and help. And that was kind of the beginning of the getting a sound system and putting on little underground raves, wasn't it? Yeah, although they weren't that little, were they? No. I mean, they started off like 1,000 people, depending on you know what the capacity of the venue was, I suppose. Um, as many people as we could cram in. Mm. Uh, but very quickly, you know, we sort of burst out of London um, and that next summer, so that would be 1990, uh, we went to the solstice, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, 1991. That was 91, yeah. yeah. No, because the first party was September 1990, mm -hmm. so yeah, that would be 1991. So and how the, how these printing methods and the stitching and sewing, how, how, the, how this became important in your lives? Um, and what techniques you use? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, for me, um, when we were doing the Spiral Tribe parties, um, we, Mark and I would always do the, the decoration, the backdrops. Um, Mark would come up with some very um, classic spiral imagery and I would kind of try and sort of develop that a bit in, in a bit of a, a diff slightly different styles. And then uh, after that, I got into making um, backdrops using stitching, hand sewing. Um, and uh, I loved the process of that, just like applique. And then I've um, been doing um, video mixing as well for SP23 and other projects. And then more recently, I've got more into uh, 
free motion quilting, which is a technique on, on the machine, um, where you can really make nice texture. And um, yeah, it's been a really good uh, good experience actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, similar to Debbie, obviously we started off with just sort of fluorescent paints because those were you know back in the days of sort of fluoro and white gloves and silly silly costumes and um, you know jelly dummies. Um, yeah, when 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 raving was young. Um, and um, as time developed, uh, well, actually across uh, a few months, um, our spiral and kind of fractal-inspired um, uh, decor uh, became less and less fluffy, and it became more black and silver. Um, and as that happened, there was this sort of entity emerging out of the darkness, out of the vacuums uh, in the sort of urban spaces, which was the sort of more classic spiral uh, iconography, which really was, it was kind of like a pirate flag kind of idea. It was kind of an anti-territory uh, claim in that, you know, the Americans will go to all the expense of going to the moon and sticking a flag in it and claiming the territory as their own. Uh, we were going into abandoned buildings or you know, into forests and up, up the mountains. And when we unfurled our flags, we were sort of reminding people that this was free space. And so the iconography very quickly uh, came to mean much more than just decoration. It really was, if you like, <clears throat> even though we didn't have computers and it was all pen and ink back in those days or, or uh, paint um, on fabric, um, it was uh, like a kind of a computer uh, icon, a shortcut, if you like. Because when we first started, it was kind of difficult to remember just where you'd been, where you'd been at the weekend. And I don't just mean what space you'd been in, but the headspace. Because when you arrive in this place, you're sort of up and you're in it and you're connecting with community and people and the, the tunes and the music and, you know, just the bass. It's just something so beautiful. And, the, and at that point in time, it was a very rare thing. You know, you couldn't really access this unless you had a sound system or you were lucky enough to... Uh, be able to get into a, an underground club or warehouse party uh, or what have you. And so come Monday and, and Tuesday, it was like, you know, we, 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 we really sort of got to this plateau of understanding um, what community really can be, you know, this sort of sense of um, togetherness, you know. It was, it was the, the, the first kind of glimpses, I think, that lots of people across... Um, the whole spectrum of society, uh, the first time they'd, they'd had opportunities to come together and feel empathetic together. Because back then, England was a very violent kind of hooligan kind of culture, very alcohol uh, driven. So again, these, these, these flags, these icons that we were uh, creating, like a little shortcut, in that you'd see that again, you just go into an empty warehouse on you know, uh, Friday, stick it on the wall, and bosh, you were back. You, you'd taken the space again, and it wasn't just uh, an empty building, it was a synaptic landscape. And each weekend that we did this, that got stronger and didn't wear off. If you could both speak a little bit about the, this dialogue between the free party, the free motion design, the fabrics, the and the, how, this, how this connects with community building, which you guys were already kind of mm -hmm. getting into there. Um, yeah, I think for me, um, the whole thing of working with textiles, um, I sort of, you know, from my grandmother, it was very much learning to knit, learning to sew, um, and so when I rediscovered it after, we painted backdrops for years, and then rediscovering just the joy of, of sitting and sewing was just such a pleasure, and it became quite addictive, and um, I just always felt, you know, instead of just sitting there and, and sort of doing nothing watching telly, I'd be there sort of stitching and then you feel like, okay, I can just sit, sit there and do, do something, because I'm actually doing something. And um, I, yeah, I can really feel sort of the spirit of my grandmother, because she was always knitting or sewing or doing something. And um, so that was a great joy for me. And these new techniques, uh, which are much more complex because you need a sewing machine, um, but you can be much more productive, you can do a lot more, which is, which is great as well. 
Um, obviously, you're kind of limited by the size of the machine and etc. and how big the fabric is and stuff like that. So that's where it's very interesting to combine with um, Mark's knowledge of screen printing um, because with him doing screen print, you can cover a lot of fabric. Um, so yeah, the two techniques together, I think, work really well. Wouldn't you agree, Mark? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I came from a slightly different uh, angle, although my mum uh, did teach me how to use the same machine when I was five or six years old. So I was very lucky from that point of view. You know, I had all my tantrums back then, and so I'm kind of, you know, quite calm around uh, all the tangles nowadays. Um, but yeah, I mean, mine, I think, was more to do with these sort of flags and banners, sort of battle banners. Um, the, 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 the sense that, you know, you could just very quickly unroll, unfurl something and just fly it high and somehow you could then sort of proclaim the space as, as free. Um, and textiles works really well for that, <coughs> obviously, because it folds up or rolls up really small. It's flexible. I really love the way it moves. Um, I, 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 I still really like banners um, and the idea of, of things outside and, and, and flying in the wind. <clears throat> you know, you get this kind of uh, sense of you know, actually feeling the, 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 the forces of nature, the, 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 the air we breathe, the, 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 the wind blowing um, um, into the, the, the deck or some kind of um, interaction going on. It's, uh, yeah, very connective in that way. And as far as, um, you know, community building goes, I think it's really great, as I mentioned before, about this sort of once you kind of tune into... Uh, what uh, uh, an icon can, 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 can access, or you can access when you're in that sort of state of mind. Um, that's very interesting. And it's, um, yeah, I guess it's a very deeply rooted thing among human beings. Uh, you know, we, we have all this kind of heraldry and flag flying and all this sort of ceremony and ritual all around that uh, for a reason, you know, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and as I say, you know, if you stick a flag in something, you're kind of laying some kind of claim to it. Uh, but we were coming from a rather, rather different angle in, with things like the number 23 and the sort of the, 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 the wind pentagrams and, and things like this. We were kind of uh, creating kind of anti-fashion, a kind of anti-icon uh, sort of vibe because um, it was really down to the viewer uh, the audience, the participants, if you like, at a rave, to make up their own minds as to what this actually meant. You know, we were never preaching anything. Um, you just had these huge, great, flying, winged 23s, uh, you know, sort of illuminated with terror strobes uh, coming at you through the monster mist smoke. And you had to make up your own mind as to what that actually meant to you. Um, and so it kind of... Uh, said loud and clear, this is not a religion, this is not a cult, this is not politics, this is not propaganda, this is just what this space is and what it means to each individual and to us as a whole. And I think that and the fact that we gave away everything, you know, we did everything for free, um, you know, those symbols went viral before there was viral, before there was phones, before there was computers. Um, and that was something that I found at the time actually a little bit spooky because it was very weird with a little 23 face which was sort of uh, our main uh, symbol back then. It would travel all over Europe before I'd arrived and you know people had copied it, it was on backdrops, it was on <laughs> stickers, uh, posters, people were using it for their own flyers and it was all very cut and paste in those days so that was the kind of the... Um, the feel for it, very DIY. And of course, you know, I'd just come somewhere I'd never been before in my life, and there it would be just going, ha ha, at me. And it's got this kind of like grin that you're not sure, you're not sure what it's thinking. You know, it's kind of like a little mirror, like a little dark mirror. You know, if you're in a good mood, then it's happy. If, you know, if you're not, then what's it doing, you know? <laughs> so it, it became an entity, and people related to that massively and that that was fantastic and so you know even though it was Debbie and I that were behind 
putting all these things out there, you know, about scissors, cutting photocopies out, gluing them down, because that's how we did things in those days. It did, it went out, and people were communicating, not just with the, 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 the music, but it was on a similar frequency as the music, in that it didn't really need any kind of explanation. Uh, these, these, these graphics, these backdrops, these images, you know, were, were weaving a web of communication and getting it out there. How, how are you um, feeling now doing this experience here at the Bell uh, with this project, using these techniques? For me, it's the first time um, here doing a workshop with Mark, and it's been a great experience, I have to say. Um, every night, sort of, there's been a different combination of people. Um, so we were always sort of sharing the, the skills, how to use a sewing machine, how to do the, the free motion quilting, um, working with different fabrics, doing applique. And um, yeah, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. You know, I think uh, everyone's been so enthusiastic that it's kind of really inspirational. Like just to meet so many people who are, who, are, who are so keen and so motivated. So, yeah, it's been a great experience. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think it connects very strongly with what Spiral Tribe was always about, even 30 years ago, um, which has its, its roots in that no superstar DJs kind of DIY uh, participatory uh, democracy you like because uh, what's nice about Abella and working with you guys is every time you've done a creative workshop it's been a very democratic democratic process in that you know we started from scratch with a group of people and we've just brainstormed ideas around uh, maybe given some structure and maybe given some technical skills um, to help people but basically just facilitating uh, people to get done what, what it is they're trying to achieve creatively. And I think that is, um, you know, something that goes all the way back um, to the very beginnings of uh, Spiral Tribe and just creating not only social space and creative space, but actually empowering people with creativity or helping people to find their creativity and express it.